Hello, my name is Eric Jensen. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about research connected to the study, how people weave online information into pseudo knowledge. So this is the overview of what I'll be covering. We'll start by talking about the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and how this concept of pseudo knowledge and false narratives in general connect in. Uh, then we'll be looking at the specifics of, of the kind of background for this study. So what is the prior research on false narratives, on pseudo knowledge and related concepts? And then how does that information feed into this particular study uh, in terms of the design and the, the coverage in this particular study? Then we'll look at the findings of this study and its implications as well as uh, kind of highlighting some of the methodological limitations of the of the particular study uh, before then connecting up with the kind of um, the larger picture of the project viral communication. Now the COVID-19 context clearly is affected by false narratives by pseudo knowledge uh, which I'll explain in a bit what that is um, but it's it's clearly affected by conspiracy theories false information, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, one of the, the key examples that gained a lot of traction uh, relatively early in the pandemic was the, the Plandemic movie, which spread false information um, about the, the virus and, and the pandemic. Um, so it's clearly a very serious issue in a, con in a public health context where we have an infectious disease. False information about that infectious disease can cause people to not adequately protect themselves because they have a, a false understanding of how the disease operates. And so this can expose people to greater danger. And so this is one of the reasons that false narratives and pseudo knowledge is so important in this context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The particular study we're looking at here is by Introne and, and co-authors. And it was published uh, in the journal Social Media and Society in 2018. So this is a study that was conducted before the COVID-19 pandemic, but we can see findings here about uh, what do we know about these wider patterns of how online information is used to weave false ideas into people's um, felt knowledge about uh, factual information. So. Uh, where they feel like they understand how something is working, they feel like they, they understand the kind of um, scientific process that's going on with a, a given disease, for example, um, when really they don't. And um, actually, this is the kind of core uh, issue that uh, first got me interested in the field of science communication research. Uh, I was very curious about this experience of how do people come to feel like they know something when that thing that they know is wrong, when it's inaccurate, uh, when it's um, objectively inaccurate, but yet you feel like uh, like you know for sure that this is the truth. That phenomenon is, is what first got me interested in, um, in the area of science communication research and in trying to understand how publics engage with science. Uh, and it's it's been a kind of um, interest that that's continued um, all, all these years. I, I first got into the area in 2001. So this is a, a, a core issue in the field of science communication and in related fields around how expert knowledge is communicated. How does it develop? How does it interact with other ways of knowing? Uh, so this is this is a really core issue. And in a context like the COVID-19 pandemic, we can see it. Uh, in stark terms, so it's it's less abstract. Um, the question of why does it matter how people develop understandings of scientific processes and information. So let's start with what are false narratives. False narratives are constructed from different pieces of information. So the, we have these kind of building blocks that we assemble our understanding, our narratives about how the world works in general and how specific parts of that world work and within our knowledge communities, um, but also individually, we construct our narratives about the world. 
And some of those narratives are accurate, they're aligned with the best available scientific information about the topic, and others are false narratives. And so this question of how do false narratives develop and become embedded, particularly in a community context, so where it's more than just one individual who kind of develops their own idiosyncratic idea, um, but it becomes something that's kind of widespread and shared. Uh, this is one of the key points where social media comes in, media in general, because it allows phenomena to scale up. So instead of it just being an idiosyncratic phenomenon, it becomes a community or a societal phenomenon. And this is where pseudo knowledge comes in because we have uh, this, this feeling that we know something, but even though that, that knowledge is not really um, based on a good foundation. So pseudo knowledge is where you apply your internal beliefs to uh, an idea, to a knowledge about how the world works um, as the, the primary criterion rather than externally established, um, scientifically based information. So um, basically it's kind of things that you feel are true. And pseudo knowledge is the process of kind of constructing, interpreting, using narratives and kind of bits of information and pieces of, um, of narratives from different sources to construct a view of what's going on with a given situation. And of course, whenever we're developing any kind of knowledge, it's affected by a combination of the internal uh, of our kind of internal notions about um, how the world works, about our values, this kind of thing, plus external uh, observation. So kind of what do we see out there in the world? Does it align with our internal views? Um, but in pseudo knowledge, uh, the internal view is taking precedence. So um, you don't believe your lying eyes, you believe what you, what you feel is true and not uh, what is the kind of best available scientific evidence or um, what you can kind of see objectively in some cases uh, around you even. So there is, this study is an example of a number of, the, there's a, a number of studies that look at this phenomenon of pseudo knowledge, that look at what criteria people use to determine whether something should be believed or not, and then how this works in practice. So we're going to run through some of the prior studies that form the foundation for the, the research we're looking at today. So uh, the one, one set of studies from Bruner looks at the idea that there are two different modes of human thought. One is a narrative based mode of thought, which is uh, about stories. And another is uh, a mode of thought based on argumentative reasoning. And the argument that Bruner develops is that each of these operate on different criteria for believability. So for narratives, the criteria is verisimilitude. Is this a plausible story? And that becomes the primary criterion for whether you believe a narrative that somebody offers you. Uh, and that is heavily affected by your internal beliefs, by your assumptions. Uh, so for example, if you have a political orientation, uh, negative assumptions about a category of people, whether that's um, stereotyping, could be ethnic stereotyping, gender stereotyping, uh, political stereotyping, um, this will influence your assessment of how believable a narrative is. So if you're then told a false narrative about that group of people that you already hold negative views about or stereotypes, then it's easier to believe those uh, that that false narrative. So that's that's the criteria for narrative-based human thought compared to the criterion for argumentative reasoning, where veracity, truth value, um, is the primary criterion. So this is Bruner's argument. Uh, I think he's definitely onto something with, with narratives and the idea that verisimilitude is the, the primary criterion for, um, for narratives to be accepted or not. Uh, the idea that argumentative reasoning is primarily about veracity could be questioned a little bit more, 
Um, there's certainly a lot of other factors that come into um, even argumentative reasoning, a lot of cognitive biases uh, and other, other issues. Another study that forms the foundation for this one is uh, kind of drawing the connection to online. So um, the online dimension has certainly added a further kind of fuel to the fire of pseudo knowledge and false narratives uh, in recent years. And um, social media in particular have sped up and and pushed this process further and harder. So uh, Starboard looks at how different websites play different roles in how they underpin false narratives. So basically, Starboard was looking at how an online community uses different types of online resources to support and adapt a narrative. So they found that sometimes narratives are used as evidence. So you can think about anecdotal evidence that's presented where people provide examples that you say like, oh, how do you know that's true? And then somebody offers a, an anecdote, a story about one person or one family that had a particular experience and they present that as evidence of the general pattern. In other cases, it's used, uh, narratives are used to develop stories in a way that can be more persuasive. So um, it's used for kind of persuasive purposes. So the point here is that within the context of a developing false narrative in an online community and as it's kind of building up and being reinforced, that the resources of that online community, the existing communications there, the, the metaphors, the ideas, um, the, the stories that are already known and accepted, these can all be mobilized in different ways to underpin and reinforce a false narrative. So some of the research questions um, that they, they went to address in this study, uh, first of all, they wanted to know what is the structure of pseudo knowledge? So um, internally within pseudo knowledge, how does this actually work? How does, how does this come to develop as a phenomenon and, uh, and how, does it, uh, how is it set up structurally? What criteria dictate the changes that are made to pseudo knowledge? So how do you change somebody's pseudo knowledge? Their feeling about the, their knowledge of the world. So they're feeling that they know uh, how the world works. Um, based on kind of intuition, internal criteria, rather than externally verified best available scientific information. And then how do people use information that's arrayed across the media ecosystem to enrich their pseudo knowledge? And this uh, mention of media ecosystems is important because we draw from a, a range of different sources when we're developing our understanding of what's going on in the world. So we are kind of cultural uh, media omnivores. We eat many different kinds of things in our kind of overall media diet, and it assembles together to form our sense of what is true and what is going on in the world. So sometimes we might not even be able to trace back exactly where did those ideas come from. We, we just kind of encounter different ideas, um, and some of those will be in alignment with how we think the world is working or how we want it to be working, and some won't. And the kind of assemblage of all these different exposures that we have to different kinds of narratives, different personas, uh, these all kind of come together to form and to reinforce and underpin our sense of how things work and how the world is working. Um, in other words, knowledge or pseudo knowledge. So now we're going to look at the methods that were used in this particular study to get an idea of, of how they went about doing this research. First of all, they focused their analysis on an online discussion forum. So they looked at a particular website called Above Top Secret and they looked at 10 years of forum discussion. And this particular forum was founded by someone who was operating with the, the name Undo. And there were a total of 6,878 posts by 1,000 plus different contributors. 
Uh, you can see here the description that was offered of the for the person who had the pseudonym undo uh, who started this forum at the outset. So on this forum, the idea is that um, they were promulgating something they were calling Stargate theory. So Stargate theory is the idea that there are alien stargates on Earth, so kind of passages for aliens on Earth. And this idea, this theory, um, was developed through storytelling. And it involved narratives, it involved uh, attacking different um, alternative ideas and um, and also kind of social dynamics as the people on the forum developed and refined this narrative. So basically, the information presented to support this view was a, a kind of cacophony of different voices and sources, some of them conventional, kind of verifiable sources, and some of them unconventional, uh, and some based purely on narrative. So the analysis of this online discussion forum involved a number of different steps. Uh, we'll go through and see the results from these different uh, steps later, but it was a discourse analysis, a narrative analysis, and a context analysis. Okay, so let's dive in. So first we'll start with a discourse analysis that was conducted. There are many different kinds of discourse analysis. This is a, a one particular kind. Uh, one methodological piece that I have cited in the past uh, speculated that there are at least 52 different kinds of discourse analysis. So on its own, saying that you're doing a discourse analysis doesn't narrow it down a lot, but we can see from, from the specifics how they went about this particular analysis of discourse. So first of all, they're looking at the flow of the conversation that was taking place on this website about uh, basically about a, a false narrative, a conspiracy theory kind of hybrid that was kind of developing what is called in this study pseudo-knowledge, so this kind of um, understanding of the world and how it came to be, in this case, on a grand scale. Um, obviously, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're talking about more specific false narratives about the emergence of the virus, um, about uh, the involvement of Bill Gates in creating the virus. Um, I mean, a variety of, of kind of more specific narratives that try to construct something different than the kind of mainline evidence-based uh, understanding of, of what, what has happened and how it happened um, based on research on past pandemics and, and how past coronaviruses uh, have developed and then um, the the more recent research on COVID-19 in particular and SARS-2. So let's have a look here. So we can see that the, there's a combination of kind of retelling the story, but kind of innovating uh, in the retelling. And Undo, the, the kind of person who started this website, has more of an interest in kind of retaining the overall structure of the narrative that uh, he or she has worked to create here uh, from the beginning. So um, here's an example, a little extract from the, the narrative construction from Undo. One of the reasons uh, for the development of, um, you know, like for how the world developed in the way that Undo thinks it has, one of the reasons is that everything was polluted. The earth was polluted, the genome of the animals polluted, Hybrids of all kinds were rampant, and apparently some of the combinations were very bad. Then you get efforts to attach new evidence. So here you can see a response and an, an effort to kind of graft on new information uh, to connect up another idea to kind of elaborate the narrative. So this is a, an effort uh, towards innovation in a way that's called stitching. So you have the initial base here, the kind of initial cloth of the narrative that's been set out, um, especially by the, the main figure on the website, Undo. And then you get participation from others working to 
to kind of uh, stitch on further knowledge. So here it says, interesting thread, Undo. Thank you. I was wondering if you had any ideas or theories about what it was that happened somewhere around 3000 BC that made writing suddenly take a 90 degree turn. So he means like writing as a, a human practice and as, as um, like the, the technology of writing uh, in 3000 BC. Up until then, writing would have been read from top to bottom, but then it changed from left to right. Can this be somehow connected to the Nam Shub of Enki, who is said to have changed the speech? So this is an example of new information, a new piece of evidence or information that this person posting the information is working to, uh, is kind of offering to graft on or stitch on to the main narrative. You also get uh, attempted mutations to the story. So here, uh, Undo is, is um, changing the story a bit. So here he says, the real big hint is the same reference as the Epic of Gilgamesh. So this is a, a real story that's existed for a long time, one of the earliest um, kind of published stories in human history, Gilgamesh. Um, so this is a common feature of this kind of false narrative where you stitch together real verifiable information, uh, or at least um, narratives that really existed for a long time uh, with the innovation that's coming from um, this, this new false narrative. So um, the Epic of Gilgamesh gate guards the scorpion men, which doesn't mean I think they are scorpions but I do believe they have tails on them rather than on their flying contrivances. For anyone who has read the entire thread, remember the image of the vase from Abydos? The, the tall beans have tails. My first thought that these were the forerunners of the pharaohs who were partially reptilian, just stated as fact, such as Nimrod's entourage, but it's difficult to say. I keep vacillating between the idea that hybridization slash modifications made to Nimrod were either machine slash reptilian, perhaps a mixture of the two, uh, explaining. So <clears throat> you get the idea. Basically, there's a, an effort to elaborate the narrative here and uh, kind of develop it further. So carrying on further with the discourse analysis, the next pattern that was identified was the tendency for there to be defenses of pseudo knowledge. So in particular, defenses of the epistemic strategies of people posting on these websites. So uh, epistemic meaning defenses of the, the way of developing knowledge or kind of what counts as knowledge. So in this case, uh, the extract here from Undo that's provided in the analysis tries to defend the kind of pseudo knowledge and false narratives uh, that are being presented as part of this conspiracy theory and to also downplay the value and expertise of those who might criticize this kind of analysis. Uh, for example, university academics. So here's the, the quote. Some myths are not myths at all, and some myths are purely myth. But when German high criticism exploded onto the scene, all ancient history was labeled myth, bar none. Every country on the planet, every people have histories. They're considered lies, fables, and myths at the university level, not because they have evidence they were lies, fables, and myths, but because they don't believe in the subject matter. You can't dis dissect a text correctly if you have no respect for it. Your view and translation will always be slanted to your own paradigm. So I think this is a good example of the kind of uh, appeal to verisimilitude. So it's perfectly plausible um, and you know, if you if you just kind of focus on plausibility, is it plausible that university academics um, are kind of arrogant jerks who don't take people's uh, stories seriously enough, and they treat them as myths unfairly, uh, that they slant their analyses to the, to match their own paradigms? Uh, of course, that's completely plausible. Um, it doesn't mean that the claims about uh, scorpion guards, scorpion human machine hybrid guards um, thousands of years ago are true at all. Um, but you can see the kind of weaving in of plausible claims um, to discredit those who might 
try to discredit these claims, um, such as university academics. And then we have the narrative analysis. So in the narrative analysis, it's looking at the structure of the conversation. So how does this kind of false narrative evolve on this kind of website? So the analysis looked at the first 500 posts on the website and it applied a method of narrative analysis drawn from Stein and Glenn, uh, as well as an earlier work by the same, from the same authors uh, that looked at four elements for each episode. So there's an initiating an event, an internal response, an action, and then a consequence. So they found that that was the, the structure for the narratives. In the context analysis, they were looking at what external resources were used in the analysis. So um, PK here stands for pseudo knowledge. And they found that there were a number of different kinds of external resources that were drawn upon to develop this false narrative, including conventional history. So actual real history, um, verifiable history. And then conventional science was a feature. News was a feature but then so was pseudo knowledge uh, as well. So you had this kind of melange of different sources external to the website that were being brought to bear to construct the pseudo knowledge. So in this analysis, they looked at this kind of context. So let's look at some of the findings. So basically uh, there are a number of episodes that were identified in the initial development of this false narrative on the website. So the initial development included uh, an, an initial presentation by Undo, the person who started it, uh, and then a series of supporting moves, uh, stitching moves, mutating moves. So you can see here represented visually um, from left to right, you can see the kind of process of bringing in evidence uh, of attack, of adjustment of the narrative, uh, of expanding of the narrative, stitching on additional information. Um, so you can see how things are developing over time and which of the moves happen at the level of the argument, <clears throat> argumentative reasoning. So citing uh, external evidence from history, for example, uh, and some uh, in running in parallel with the narrative dimension. So the ones that were appealing uh, on the basis of stories. So here, this is a kind of um, visual representation of the development of this, uh, of this conspiracy theory, the, the Stargate theory uh, within this website. So they were interested in the study and how do these kinds of stories evolve and change over time? Uh, so uh, the five, initial 500 posts was looking at how do they get born, how do they get started um, initially, and then the second part is how does it change? So uh, from that initial start, how does it evolve? So one of the interesting features in the change of a false narrative over time or a conspiracy theory is the phenomenon of an attack. So there's an example in this analysis where one of the people who posted quite frequently was familiar with one of the ancient texts that Undo cited uh, in order to defend their, uh, the claim um, for, for one of the episodes uh, for kind of elaborating the story. So this attack from Indelkoffer um, basically was successful in undermining the claim that Undo had presented. And so he actually, Undo just, uh, he or she, Undo replaced their episode 2.1 um, in terms of their, their kind of what they had provided. They went in and replaced it with a new explanation that didn't rely on those ancient texts that Indelkoffer um, kind of cited um, and focused on for, for the attack. So this indicates that this kind of pushback process or attempted debunking can play a role even in this kind of context of pseudo knowledge. So um, particularly when there are appeals to external sources, if it can be demonstrated 
in an effective way that those external sources are not in fact saying what the people on the website are claiming that they're saying, there is potential for amendment of the story. Now that doesn't mean that the, it was any less of a kind of false narrative, it just means that there was kind of accommodation made to this attack. So it wasn't just purely rejecting the attack because it was an external source that Undo had leaned on for support, for epistemic support, uh, support for the, uh, the kind of knowledge claim, um, then that support was adapted based on the attempted debunking. So effectively the debunking was kind of incorporated in. So in terms of responding to an attack, this, um, this figure here shows how this kind of process can play out. So you have uh, an attack basically pushing changes in the narrative. So you, in this case, they show where things were moved and inserted and replaced in order to adapt to the attack, in order to kind of adjust the, the story to respond to and accommodate the attack. So innovation is, uh, is another important dimension of how these narratives unfold and develop. So here there are attempts at stitching, at kind of adding on additional um, elements and mutation. So adjusting the existing narratives. And most of these, there was a kind of clear power dynamic here where Undo as the initial founder of the website was, was kind of seen as the authority here. And so most of these efforts at stitching and mutation, as we saw in the earlier examples, were framed as questions like, do you think this, do you think that? Um, and rarely did Undo accept these proposed changes to the theory, um, but they noted an exception where somebody who posted frequently and also had connections to other fora, uh, Zorgo, did have one of his or her mutations accepted. So this was a mutation to the narrative about water on Mars and Undo accepted that, said, yeah, that's right, yeah. And uh, so they speculate about why Undo did that and um, was it a matter of building community, of kind of getting Zorgo invested in, in this narrative, uh, for example. So now we come to the context analysis. And here you can see in the context analysis, the different kinds of resource types. So remember, these are things like um, history, uh, media, science, images, theological references, uh, academic sources, uh, actually the least frequent uh, category, uh, and, and kind of relying recourse to pseudo knowledge. Um, so as you can see in terms of the quantitative representation here, pseudo knowledge was the most common characteristic that for, for resource types. That was, that was definitely the most common um, recourse. The next most common was historical knowledge or historical episodes, uh, and then other media, science, images, and, uh, and reference sources, uh, and then personal. Uh, but in terms of the, the, kind, the kind of move being represented uh, with each of these, evidence was the most common, uh, followed by stitching. So here you can see some of the kind of quantitative representations of the patterns. You can see that pseudo-knowledge is heavily relied upon, but it's a very mixed economy here of sources for feeding in to the narrative. Uh, some of those sources are things like news and science. Uh, so this, this is not 
a simple story of it being entire, entirely made up in fantasy. And this is one of the things that gives verisimilitude or plausibility to these kinds of false narratives. So this is something that we see in all of the, um, the kind of false narratives that are circulating widely around COVID-19. So the Bill Gates story, the kernel of truth there is that Bill Gates has been working for a long time on trying to combat infectious disease. So uh, he's been uh, associated with infectious disease um, like, um, like the coronavirus and, and other um, previous infectious viruses, but he was associated because he was trying to fix them and um, was funding a lot of work to make things better. Um, but that got twisted to kind of the opposite. Um, but it's, it has that kind of bit of objective evidence that you can connect to news or, uh, or science or imagery. So, um, for example, it probably wouldn't be hard to find a, an image of Bill Gates in a lab coat. So that particular conspiracy theory can be fueled by some materials. Um, likewise, with the, the idea that the 5G network was somehow spreading the coronavirus, uh, you could see because 5G networks were set up in population centers that um, there was a correlation between 5G locations, uh, broadcast locations, and where the coronavirus is hitting because those were both affected by a third variable, which is population density. So um, it's kind of taking something that you can show, you can show like a map of 5G networks, you can overlay it on, on the map of uh, coronavirus, and you can lend plausibility and the appearance of kind of scientific or objective evidence to the false narrative. Another thing that they looked at in the context analysis was the network of relationships among domains that were referenced in the posts. So they show that you can see there's a kind of core and periphery in terms of which websites were cited um, most in the, in, the, uh, in, in the development of this narrative. So this kind of core periphery structure and the use of external resources um, means that there's this kind of mass of supporting evidence and supporting research that can be mentioned, uh, even if it's not coherently integrated into the story itself. So in this example from Shugo, you can see just because it's in print on the web doesn't mean it's real, but when the research is presented and the facts are presented with the results of the test and the procedure, we call that proof, where's yours? And then undo responses, it's so completely frustrating, you have no idea. There's a ton of really good research and reference material, including data from government research labs, uh, all this kind of data, and why didn't you read it? Uh, you know, it's all right there. So um, you can see this kind of vague claim to having a lot of evidence to support. And this is the kind of rhetoric you see from, uh, from Donald Trump, who um, was, was identified in a study as the number one source for misinformation about the coronavirus globally. You can see the same kind of thing of just kind of vague claims of scientific support for his understanding, his pseudo knowledge and, and what he's putting forward. Um, without clear connections between how the evidence supports the, the claim. So the summary perspective here, pseudo knowledge is something that is dynamic, it's developing. Um, the way that pseudo knowledge develops is a kind of um, omnivore approach of drawing on a range of sources um, for the more kind of respected sources of information, there's a tendency not to specify exactly how they support the evidence, but just to kind of vaguely cite them as, uh, as supporting evidence. And there's a willingness to adjust the theory to um, avoid the kind of attacks and to kind of uh, mitigate attacks when um, participants in the, the website in this case have some kind of external knowledge about that topic. 
Now, it's worth bearing in mind that this study does have some limitations. It was conducted focusing on one website. So it was a deep dive on a single forum. And so that means that there's naturally questions about the generalizability of the findings. Um, for one part of the study, they only looked at the first 500 posts to uh, look at how the narrative developed. And there are many other theories out there, and they didn't look at the kind of details of how Undo's theory is connecting to others that are out in, in the kind of uh, universe of pseudo-knowledge. But I think this is a helpful study for giving us a kind of detailed perspective on how this kind of pseudo-knowledge develops and how it's structured and what are the kind of rhetorical moves that are made so that people can defend and retain their claims even when there are attacks on, uh, on the quality of the evidence. Uh, also kind of highlights the role of external sources and appeals to evidence in the development of this kind of pseudo-knowledge. And I think, again, there's a critical point here about the importance of verisimilitude in assessment of false narratives. So that's what people are looking at. They're not, in general, doing deep dives into the specific evidence and whether it aligns with the, the narrative. They're looking at, is this plausible to me? And plausibility is a much lower threshold for evidence than is this based on the best available scientific knowledge. And um, it's also a lot easier for anybody to apply. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have expertise in order to draw judgments about a narrative based on verisimilitude, based on how it, uh, the plausibility um, as it appears to you, especially, which is the primary criterion for pseudo knowledge as opposed to knowledge, is that it aligns with your internal beliefs. So does the narrative align with your internal beliefs as opposed to does it align with external evidence that's high quality evidence um, and uh, so it's it's just a different way of operating and it's important to bear that in mind that when we talk about um, kind of narratives about what's going on that have a lot of scientific evidence behind them versus um, plaus uh, like kind of superficially plausible narratives that are false um, part of the distinction for why those false narratives can circulate is because there's a different criterion at work. And that different criterion is also quite important for how social media can help to spread these false narratives because plausibility and alignment with your internal beliefs are also key determinants in whether you share a social media post. So you have the same kind of criteria operating that then get um, a kind of false narrative promulgated through social media uh, because of how easy it is to share false narratives. So in the context of the viral communication project, looking at public responses to the pandemic, this issue of false narratives and conspiracy theories uh, is critical because uh, there have been widespread uh, issues with people believing false narratives about the pandemic and having that actually affect their behavior. So, uh, for example, claims that it's all a hoax, that, the, that there is no real pandemic going on, that it's just made up um, for people to claim power. These kinds of narratives uh, can play in to a plausible view of authorities as untrustworthy, as, as willing to lie to the public in order to retain control. But in this case, it's quite dangerous to believe those because they align with a kind of superficial plausibility, because then people aren't taking the steps to protect themselves. They're protesting uh, public health measures that are demonstrated to make a difference in other countries that have successfully locked down um, the virus um, through taking early preventative measures, uh, for example, in New Zealand, uh, in Taiwan, in a lot of countries that have gotten the virus under control. They did so by kind of mobilizing their population, um, retaining a kind of population wide commitment to addressing the real problem that was facing their country. And uh, the fact that you have a number of cases where the, the false narratives have taken enough of a hold in a country 
that you can uh, you get a kind of breakdown of social solidarity and norms around addressing the pandemic. So it saps the energy and the solidarity that's needed to really get a hold of the virus and, and to get it under control, which then allows other things to happen, like um, opening of the economy, as these other countries have been able to do. So misinformation, fake news, conspiracy theories, um, false narratives are kind of laced throughout these. Um, and we have false narratives gaining traction around the COVID-19 pandemic um, for a number of reasons. One is that um, it's a topic that people don't have deep specialist knowledge in themselves. So they don't have deep knowledge of the external scientific evidence. And so they have to rely on proxies. So that proxy might be a highly respected scientist uh, like uh, Dr. Fauci in the United States. But it can also be that people rely on other proxies for having direct scientific knowledge themselves. And um, they're relying on plausibility, alignment with their internal beliefs. Um, so the same kind of procedures that help to spread false narratives in general are also operating in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the consequences are life and death. 